And a hearty welcome and happy Father's Day to one and all. This is episode 215 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you for spending some of your Father's Day with me here in New York. We're going to skip past the promotional BS once again. We'll save that for the end and get right into the, the guts of the episode. So today is Father's Day, and it is a time one such as myself remembers his father in particular, his grandfather, and I guess his other grandfather, and then the other wonderful fathers I know. So my dad was quite brilliant in his way, and I talked about him on the channel, but not really from the angle of parenting, what it means to be a dad. And people can say, they can agree with certain questions or agree to certain answers to questions like, what does it take to be a good father? And maybe they put it into practice, maybe they don't. Or perhaps they just don't agree what's the most important thing to be a good father. What I know about my dad is there are certain questions that he answered differently than the average person, simply because either he picked it up from his parents or the social circle when he was growing up, you know, even as a kid in the Bronx. But here's one thing I know for certain, this is not a judgment. If my old man, Alan Philip Cohen, born August 31st, 1942 in the Bronx, passed August 26th, 2022. If he had been asked the question, what's the most important thing to being a father? What does it mean to be a good father? Well, I think he would have given more or less standard answer. He would have said, well, spend as much time with your, your child as you can. Do the best you can to teach them to be kind, decent, hardworking, funny, non-judgmental. Let people do their thing. That's about it. But if he had been asked, is it important to spend a lot of time with your kid? He said, well, of course. He would think that's a stupid question, but ask it a little bit differently. Would you rather have would you rather make less money, spend more time with your kid, or would you rather be somebody who is very successful, but is going to have huge chunks of his life where he does not have the capacity to spend that much time with his kid or kids? Now, I believe that Alan Philip Cohen would have thought about that before answering, but I think that he would have said, I think that he's got to Father's got to make, he's got to make the bread. He's got to make sure that his kids are taken care of, that his, his spouse is taken care of. There's a roof over their head. You don't want to be, he would never have wanted to put himself willingly, as this is a make-believe fantasy scenario, but he wouldn't have ever wanted to live a life where there was ever a possibility of financial ruin. Unfortunately, now it's more likely that people are living paycheck to paycheck and don't really have savings and may be living paycheck to paycheck with enormous amounts of debt. We, we know this. He was taught because both of his parents were products of the Great Depression. He perhaps understood the dollar and his generation, I guess kind of the silent generation. Dad wasn't a boomer. He was before the baby boom, as was my mother. The dollar was looked upon differently it was the almighty dollar. And if you have the opportunity to earn a lot of those dollars, that's your focus. You're a husband, you're a father, gotta be a good provider. Whatever your field is, whatever your area of expertise is, that's the most important thing that you can do and be. Be kind, spend time with your kids when you can. Take vacations when you can. Kick back. Enjoy the fruits of your labor when you can. But therein lies the rub. Because that is also up for debate. 
What does when you can mean? My dad's partners would take their five to six weeks of vacation every year. Now, my dad was a CPA. This mug is not here by accident. He was the C in the SCF and Co. Certified Public Accounts. Had a nice little mid-sized firm. But S and F, Mr. Shulman, who is still doing great, what a fucking baller. There was a guy who went to NYU, not only got a CPA, got a law degree. He was a lawyer. You know, it's like, catch me if you can. You're a doctor and a lawyer. Yeah. You're a CPA and a lawyer? Yes. Hal Shulman, one of the greats. But Hal Shulman and the late Mike First, dad's other partner, they all worked their fucking asses off. There's no easy road in that profession. They were both husbands and fathers. The idea, though, if you reach a point in that business, partner level or managing partner of a mid-sized firm, as Alan Philip Cohen, APC, CPA, well, if you're not able to take your vacation, then who would ever be able to take their vacation? You're not going to get fired. You're not losing clients. You have good staff. If dad took two weeks a year when he was in his 30s, 40s, and 50s, that was a lot. It's just the way that he was wired. His partners were also products of parents who lived through the Great Depression. But they managed to compartmentalize what they learned. And they were able to let go a little bit to understand that, okay, we're not going to work as many hours as maybe we thought we were going to at this point. But hey, we're doing pretty good. We got a nice little firm here. They were able to not stress over taking the five weeks a year. Dad was obsessed with it. Couldn't help it. So he was always working. And I don't want to sound as if I was an ungrateful kid. It made me treasure the time I got to spend with him more, would be a, a true statement. And just so you understand, we watched a shit ton of Yankee games together when I was a kid, often at the end of a hard day of work. And also, I understand, Dad was always in an air-conditioned office or a climate-controlled office. Sometimes he drove, depending on if he was going to clients, sometimes he took the train. When I say hard day of work, I'm talking about this. He never did physical labor. He did physical labor in the army. That's it. But he was not a laborer. But he gave a lot of himself in that field. And I used to get the sense occasionally that, that people who were in um, the kinds of professions where they had to actually use their bodies, they looked down on people like my dad. They looked down on accountants. Yeah, go get your protractor. Well, that's the wrong field. Shut up. That sort of thing. I used to look forward to, used to do this thing when I was old enough to, um, to play baseball. I had an aptitude. I had an aptitude. I, I wasn't like a, a super gifted at baseball. I wasn't a prodigy, but I, I had an aptitude for a number of sports where I had talent that didn't really make sense. I would say the sport that I had the greatest aptitude for was tennis. Uh, the first time I picked up a racket when I was six, I swung it like I knew what I was doing, even though I didn't. Just sometimes you just have it. But when I got to be about eight years old, I had an unusual skill. And dad realized I was good at catching fly balls. For any of us who've played Little League or remember our experiences in Little League, eight, nine, ten-year-old kids, it's tough for them to catch fly balls. You start running in and then the ball goes 100 feet over your head, right? We've all experienced that. The great scene in the movie Parenthood, Steve Martin, where his son, who's struggling in every way, he just gets completely cocked up. He's running in and the ball is 50 feet over his head. But I used to like, my dad would take me to my old elementary school, Fairfield. That was kind of the nearest ball field. It was maybe a half a mile, uh, half a mile north of the old house in Massapequa. Now far from all American, for uh, you Massapequa natives and Massapequa Bowl at the corner of Route 107 and Merrick Road. I lived a couple of blocks away from there. But we would go to Fairfield and dad would bring a bat and at least one baseball, sometimes two, just in case some weird shit happened and it went down a drain. 
and I would bring my glove. And I always had a first baseman's glove because I typically played first base. But I really enjoyed tracking and catching fly balls. And some of my best, most enjoyable memories. When he was off, it could have been tax season on a Sunday. And I should have let him sleep. I shouldn't have hectored him into taking me, hey, can we catch flies? Okay, Jerry. I shouldn't have done that. I look back on it. I didn't really understand. Because when you're a kid, you get the idea, oh, dad has to do this to make money so that we can live it. Yeah, but it doesn't land. It doesn't sink in the way that it will later on. Looking back on it, getting it, and seeing my father, even into his 60s, there were times I was still working six days a week. And an even sicker thing is, people coming up behind him, who are the age he was when he could no longer work six days a week, they're still working six and sometimes seven. Or as he said, counting professions gone to the dogs. I wouldn't recommend anybody get into it. You want to work seven days a week for the rest of your life? Knock yourself out. Not for him. But he still busted his tail. The commute was difficult. But we would go out there and he would stand at home plate and he would fungo the ball. And his goal was to hit fly balls as far as he could. And I never really considered my father a great athlete, but he could hit the ball a long way without it being pitched to him. There was a time we were playing on the, um, the kind of B field at Fairfield. And what I mean is there were two baseball diamonds at the elementary school. The one that was closer to Sunrise Highway, so slightly north. There was a day we were playing on the B field and my dad hit the ball almost to the building. He was not a big guy. He was maybe 180 pounds, but he had played softball. Apparently he was a pretty good softball pitcher. He didn't look like a great athlete, even though he had the kind of athletic, like he was a very fit looking guy. But there was this one time he had to have hit the ball 300 feet from home plate and it almost carried all the way to the school, which was probably about 350 or 360 feet away. But he just annihilated this ball and he hit it over my head. I ran back and it actually was over my head because normally the idea, if you're playing the outfield, even just goofing off and having fun with your father, you want to be running in and not running back. But those were some of my treasured memories. I don't know that we ever did it on a Father's Day. I hope I was a little bit nicer to him on Father's Day and didn't make him, you know, do anything that he didn't want to do. But he was, he was a good dad. As much as I had a lot of issues with him and he had infinitely more issues with me. His heart was always in the right place. I don't recall him ever engaging in behavior towards me or my sister for that matter, which could be construed as spiteful. He didn't make that many important decisions when he was not level-headed. And my dad had a temper. He had a temper. He didn't have a temper. His father had a worse temper. And Grandpa Nat was an absolute home run hitter. He was an, just an incredible, he was a great man. You don't say that about many, but Nathan Cohen was a great man. And he raised a really good man in his son, my father. Sonny, uh, on Father's Day, this is the third uh no, it's the second Father's Day without my dad, but Father's Day 2022, he was unfortunately, he was very close to, he was very close to the end. He passed um, a little over two months later. He was just in, in really bad shape. It's tough to see that too. But my dad was an even-tempered person. He used to get excited during Yankee games. He'd go batshit crazy when things went wrong or when things went right. I mean, we had some amazing, incredible celebrations during the Yankees' run in the 90s because most of those games, you know, the younger generation, it's history and you can catch it on YouTube, the 96 World Series, Charlie Hayes, all that great stuff if you're a Yankees fan. But we watched it in real time. And most of those games during that run, 96, 98, 99, 2000, four World Series in five years. It was just dad and me in the old house. Well, not that old. It's 28 years old now. He bought it new. But it was just the two of us 
watching those games in Huntington and going nuts when the Yankees won. I mean, the Yankees were always a big part of his life. They were a big part of our shared experiences, the number of games we went to, the number of playoff games we went to. His heart was always in the right place. He learned from his dad. And Grandpa Nat was somebody who, unlike my father, Grandpa Nat had to work well below his station until he was into his 40s. That's when he was able to get into the bowling alley business. Quite a, a series of very lucky breaks. So here's one thing, and this is a hill that I'll go down on, just from my experience and my understanding. There is an idea of, especially somebody, either a sole proprietor, or maybe they have a, a partner or partnership, whether or not it's officially a partnership for tax purposes. But you could have lunch pail guys, like my grandpa and his partner, Harold. Harold, I think, has about 15 grandkids now, if I'm not mistaken, or had, that uh, he, he's passed. But there is an idea that there are certain kinds of guys, lunch pail guys, that work their tails off and earned every cent. Now, that's true. You won't get any argument from me. But my grandpa, if somebody said he was self-made, he would laugh. He would say, do you know how many different people gave me a helping hand at various points of my life? How do you think I got the bowling alley in the nightclub, Junior? Got a loan. How did I get that loan? Because I knew someone who vouched for me and someone else vouched for me. So they didn't do it all on their own. Now, my dad got lucky in the sense that he found a profession that you didn't necessarily have to be a big personality because he was still very awkward in his late teens, way more awkward than me. He found a profession that where he was able to thrive and advance simply by being really competent. But when you become a dad, you become a father, you're a husband. I don't know that my dad ever imagined himself being a father, getting married. I don't know. We never talked about that. I do know that Grandpa Nat and Grandma Irene, may they both rest in eternal paradise, two of the all-timers. Grandma Irene was the, the prototypical, not even a stereotypical Jewish grandmother. She was the prototype. Irene Weinstein... Married my grandfather, Cohen. She was the prototype. Grandma Irene. Knitting sweaters, baking cookies, making mandel bread, making chopped liver. Are you sure you've had enough, darling? I don't think you've had enough. You look like you're still hungry. Can I give you another bowl of matzo ball soup, darling? Irene Weinstein. They did not know that my dad was capable. And we were being honest. There were stretches of my life where my parents didn't think that I was capable. They knew that my dad was smart, hard worker, was going to probably make a good living. But that's not the same thing as having a family and being a father and having to deal with your own feelings of insecurity and awkwardness. Nothing I would have ever contemplated with regards to my father. Not until I reached a certain age where all of these things clicked. I was well into my 20s before I understood the miracle of my and my sister's existence. That this awkward kid grew up to be a dad and a darn good one at that. But at a certain point, everything he did was for my sister and I. And a kind of turn, and this is another thing where there's no, this is not really a right or wrong this is just a process. This is when people have moments where they feel that their, their existence has altered, and now what am I going to do? Alan Philip Cohen was 62, still working a full schedule, making really good money. Easy for me to say, but he was making really good money. Um, SCF and Co. was rocking and rolling. They had good clients who paid on time, very important in professions like that. And at age 62, while visiting his father, Grandpa Nat was in his early 90s and still had years of life, years of quality life to go. My dad suffered spinal and hip fractures. He was osteoporotic. He had not taken care, even though he had the appearance of someone who was fit. There were warning signs. 
warning signs. The hip didn't necessarily feel great. He never said a word about his hip to me. Never said anything. I think I might have bursitis. Maybe I should make sure it's just bursitis. Nothing. Never said a word about any hip pain or any weird feelings in the hip. Nothing. His back always bothered him. Never saw a chiropractor. Never saw an ortho. Yeah, I don't believe in that shit. Okay, okay. But when he suffered that disaster, he was in traction for seven weeks. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't have lasted a day. I would have given up and just accepted that I'm probably going to be in a wheelchair the rest of my life. Because they couldn't do a hip replacement. See, a young person breaks the acetabulum bone in a disaster. It, it happens. Could be a car accident, some horrendous fall. It happens. A person who is not osteoporotic can do a hip replacement. And in a couple of months, you're going to be okay. My dad's bones were so weak. It was not on the table. There was no scenario. He was not a good candidate for a hip replacement. They weren't just fucking with him. They would have done it if they thought it would do any good, but his bones were too brittle at the time. When he was laid up in that hospital in Florida for all those weeks, and I visited him, dad didn't cry that much, not until the very end of his life. He kind of became much more emotional. Well, he always had it in him. His edit function disappeared, and he was more likely to tell you exactly how he was feeling. It's kind of close to the best personality until near the very end. But when he was in Florida, in pain, not knowing if he was ever going to walk again, with his leg in the air, my sister visited him, I visited him, and he, without saying it, that was the point where he stopped living for himself at all. Not that he was a big vacation guy, but everything that he did from when he got home, a lot shorter. My dad and I used to be almost the same height. Maybe I was a half inch taller than him, maybe an inch. I'm about 6'2". Dad was about 6'1 plus. He returned from Florida. He's maybe 5'9 and a half. Maybe. The disaster cost him that much height. He seemed like a doddering little old man having just turned 63. That was pretty pretty bad for me to witness. Guess he made his peace with it. Rarely complained. He was not a complainer. I wish that he had complained that there were certain things that were bothering him, but he didn't. But that experience did change him. SCF and co merged with a, a larger firm, a much larger firm. That's how you retire in the accounting profession. If you don't think you have a spectacular staff, that can retire you on their own. Like if you have 10 home run hitters working for you, you're good. But if you only have like three or four, probably want to merge with a firm with a hundred and something partners and then you'll, you'll be taken care of. But he lived for my sister and I. And he wasn't, he wasn't the most warm individual. Like he could, he could be emotional, but he got embarrassed very easily. And it's funny, now that I'm thinking of it, when I was a little kid, he would give me hugs, he would smooch my cheek, he would me mess with my hair, and I would giggle. And he always said something like, and this was until I was about six, he would say, I got to play with your hair now, because at a certain point in time, you're not going to want your old man to do that. Ironically, he didn't like public displays of affection. He didn't like me hugging him. He, when I say he didn't like, he didn't get angry, but he got embarrassed. His face would turn red if I would give him a big hug in front of family or whatever it might be. Even my sister, she could tell you the same thing. It's just how he was wired. He got embarrassed very easily. But you reach a point where the person that has cared for you in different ways and then my mother was the primary caregiver for most of my younger life, certainly. And I moved in with my dad when I was 18. So he was a primary caregiver from there. But it is true, as people get older, sometimes they get crankier and more easy, easily upset, enraged. And other times, they're not. And I feel like as my dad got older, he was less likely to really lose his shit. 
And so he retired. He was 70 when he completely left accounting. And by that point, I was no longer, I wasn't living with him anymore, but I was living close enough. I saw him frequently. We still would go to Yankee games. We talked on the phone a lot. Like he was the kind of dad, after a great Yankee game, he would call and we would talk about it. It was something that we always looked forward to. Obviously, we just wanted the team to win. But somewhere around 2017, now he was a neat freak. His house was always immaculate. And it remained that way until, unfortunately, his car accident, which would pretty much is what ended his life. Somewhere around 2017, the light went out in his eyes. And it's hard to explain because on the surface, he seemed exactly the same. But when I look at pictures of him from that era, he doesn't look the same, even though he seemed the same. He was still writing checks to pay every bill. His checkbook was immaculate. There was not a single cross out in years of him writing checks and keeping, the, keeping it balanced and all of that. His penmanship was beyond perfect. They said he should have been a doctor and he couldn't have been a doctor. His penmanship was too good. He always wrote all capital letters and each letter was a work of art. And he was a shitty artist. He wasn't an artist, but these are the things, these are the things that you remember. But sometime around 2017, the light began to go out in his eyes. And he experienced until the car accident, what you would call be a normal decline as you get older. But he was still living life and getting the most that he could from every day. And the truth is, he loved retirement. I don't know that he had master plans about what he would do when he finally walked away completely as he did at 70, because he had kind of semi-retired at 66, 65, and had cut back the schedule four days a week, three days a week, and doing stuff like that, a little bit of consultancy work. I don't know what he expected retirement to be, but he got more out of it than I thought. So he didn't have conventional hobbies. Owing to the fact that his back was often an issue, he loved tennis, he didn't really play. He loved to bowl, not surprisingly his dad owning a bowling alley. He was afraid to bowl, he thought he would hurt himself. And after the injuries in 2005, those kinds of activities were out. Like he couldn't even dance at a wedding because there was a chance he could slip. And another great Dr. Lee quote, I recommend you don't dance, Mr. Cohen. You're not a good candidate for a fall. Not a good candidate. Not a good candidate for surgery and also wasn't a good candidate for a fall. There is still, almost two years later, there is still a hollow feeling knowing that he's not around. And this house here, where I'm sitting right now, it was his idea. And to say that it wouldn't have been possible without him, well, that's stating the obvious. Because I struggled for decades to make any kind of a toehold in professional endeavors like the movie business, the writing business. And even if I pissed him off, he didn't stay mad long. For somebody who appeared to be cynical, he was actually more hopeful now that I'm thinking about it. He just wanted me to be happy, ultimately. And he wanted my sister to be happy. And despite the two of us being so similar, we each have always shown different strengths and weaknesses. He parented us differently. I don't know that that was also, or like, was that part of a part of his plan? But he just came to it. He never handled us the same way. And I don't think it's just because of the age difference. I mean, when we were both adults, he spoke to me in a different tone than he spoke to my sister. He was a really good dad tearing up now. I apologize. If he was not, if he was not as great a man as his father, because Grandpa Nat was somebody who was born to nothing. Mother died during the, um, the flu pandemic of 19, uh, 1918, excuse me. Never knew his father. His father was either an alcoholic, a drug addict, or just a socio-psychopath. Nobody really knows for sure. He came from nothing being raised by his eldest sister and became 
champion of industry. Bowling alley and nightclub are still going in Woodmere. And the one of the primary owners, hold on one sec, I'm sorry. There's two primary owners and one of them worked with my grandfather for years. He always said the same thing. Grandpa was great at everything. He was just a genius. Some people just have the magic. Grandpa Nat had the magic. But Grandpa was a great man. He raised two amazing kids, and my father and my aunt, who was, and she's great. Now, her and I definitely had our ups and downs. But um, the further into life I get, the more I get her and understand her. And, um, yeah, there's no way around it. If my dad was not quite his father, he was really close. That's about the, um, the biggest praise I could give to him. And um, I do miss him, not just because today is Father's Day, but I miss the, just the normal stuff, sitting and watching movies. You know, Chariots of Fire, which I always talk about, that was one of his favorite movies too. We could always sit and watch Chariots of Fire. He loved the movie Rounders. He loved Angel Heart. He loved The Thin Blue Line. He loved Pulp Fiction. He loved Dirty Harry. Never got into Star Wars, unfortunately. Blue Velvet, he thought, was just okay. It was not one of his favorites. Alan Philip Cohen, my dear old dad. Nathan Cohen, my grandfather. I miss them both very much. But I am grateful. I am grateful that they held the place in my life that they did. And in memory, always will. This has been episode 215 of the Confessions of a Not So Damn. I'm sorry, now I'm laughing because this turned into a four hanky weeper. Um, Episode 215 of the Confessions of a Not-So-Dangerous Mind podcast. I'd like to thank you all for spending some of your Father's Day with me here in New York. If you checked out this episode on the YouTube channel, haven't done so already, please click like, subscribe, comment, share, turn on those notifications. Or if you caught this episode on the audio platform, such as Spotify or iTunes, same general rule applies. Click like, subscribe, share, and turn on those notifications. I'll be back for, I promise, no crying, there's no crying in baseball. No crying. Episode 216, real, real soon. Until then, happy Father's Day to all fathers who are still with us. And happy Father's Day in memory of those who aren't. Peace.